This morning I woke up really tired and I was trying to go back to sleep and when I was trying to go back to sleep I was experiencing that kind of remote viewing thing and usually that only happens at night when I'm trying to fall asleep the first time but not in the morning when I'm kind of waking up and trying to go back to sleep. So it could be a sign that my brain is starting to go into altered states-ish. And I felt a little bit of like, I wouldn't say they're like suicidal thoughts, but just a little bit, kind of, I think feeling the pressure of getting out of here it might be good to go sooner rather than later, but two more weeks and then I'm out of here. And I was also feeling a bit of weirdness around not talking to certain people, but usually when I leave, I'm on good terms, but I don't know, just not feeling it. And my stomach's been bothering me. Yesterday I started typing a blog post and then I ended up typing 7,000 words. And I think I fried my brain a little bit. There were parts of the day when I was typing where I literally felt my body disappearing. And then I was remembering that I'm not supposed to be working on stuff like that. Oh, just one little quick blog post, an update, and it turns into 7,000 words. So I need to remember to go back to doing nothing because this energy, if I put it into doing, will augment that. And I was making, I was writing an article about non-doing but then I did a lot of words. So, tomorrow I'm going to a nice concert. Sunday I have plans to meet a new person, which could be cool, but it might not be the right time to meet a new person. So I'm a little bit, this morning being tired and not wanting to get up and remote viewing and consciousness leaving the body, it's like, ugh. I need to really lay low. But the energy makes it hard to remember that. This morning I took a methylfolate and a tyrosine because that's what I usually do on the days when I feel a little bit depressed in the morning. And it, it usually works like a charm. By the time I'm up and about, I don't feel any of that at all. So I think that kind of stuff does work and it's helpful to take something to mitigate whatever is happening in terms of lower consciousness. Today at work, we were talking about some different videos related to tricks of perception visual perception and hearing and spoiler alert there's one where there's this robotic sound and it just sounds like this robotic sound and then you play the exact same clip again before but before you play the clip you say to yourself I don't even know what the word was like green lantern or something I don't know and then you hear the thing say green lantern and then you play the exact same clip again, and before it you say, brainstorm. And then you hear brainstorm, and it's the same clip. So whatever you say first is what you will hear. And then I thought of a trick, say, green buzzer or something, and then brainstorm, one after the other, and see what you hear. And people, it was mixed. And then say it the other way around, and it was also mixed. So it reversed for me, but I don't know, I don't remember which one I heard, the first one or the second one that was set. And then there was another one where there's a pink shoe with a white stripe, but some people see a green shoe with a silver stripe or a gray stripe or something. But if you keep looking at it long enough and you think about pink and white, you will see the shoe turn pink and white in front of your eyes. And there was another one with a 
white and gold dress and some people see blue and black not white and gold and then of course there's the classic count the basketball passes and then focus on that and then after you watch it again you see that there was a gorilla that walked through the screen that you didn't even notice and he walks right through the middle and then there was another one where it's like a card trick and you're focusing on the cards and you don't notice that they swap out shirts, they swap the background, they even swap the tablecloth from black to a white color. I didn't even see that one, but I saw two others, but only because the person kind of told that there would be changes in the background. And then somebody shared that there's this experiment that people can do if the person who is the test subject doesn't know of the experiment. But something along the lines of if there's a group of people and they're all in on it except the one person and a per there's a blue napkin in front of the person and everybody around them is convincing them that it's pink. It will eventually look pink to the person who is the test subject, not to the other people. And it is in fact still blue for real. So these are interesting. Oh, and there was another one that they play a sound and people either hear Yanni or Laurel. And it's the same sound. And it's not the other instance where you say what it is before, you either hear one or the other. And it kind of got me thinking about perception, which I think I used to talk about a little bit. But in terms of like, the pink napkin or the blue napkin appearing pink after a while of being convinced it reminds me of the mental health system it's like if everybody around you saying it's a mental illness eventually or pretty quickly you're going to see it as that because of the social pressure to think that that's so but what if there was evidence of oneness like no it's one one consciousness one mind blah 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 and then also the thing that caught me too about the one when you say a certain word that's what you hear it made me realize that the words that we say are really important which people already kind of know but like if I say certain words that's what I'm gonna how I'm gonna see it so I need to like fix my vocabulary be even more careful with words even saying the word I makes one feel like an I when one isn't. One can say one, one feels one. Speaking in third person, I think that is, but can one speak in oneness? And, and then that changes what we perceive after. And it also shows one can hear one thing or another, depending on one's brain. So there, a certain bit of information can be heard in multiple ways. So for people to think, see, they see something a certain way and someone else sees it a different way, like, oh, is it a mental illness or is it, um, you know, a spiritual thing or something? Well, it depends on how one hears about it and has one's brain attuned, that's what they're gonna think. And since there's a, like a huge system of money around thinking that it's a mental illness, well, that's how it's gonna be. And for the people, not the people that are thinking that, but the people that are experiencing things, they get that put on them.
back? Should we back up? So you can come back? Oh, it's so cute. I can't believe you Yeah. It's like the perfect bluff. He struck gold. Why don't you just pick up the whole thing? That is so cute. He'd probably let us get closer, but I want to be respectful. He's even like playing with it with his feet. Uh oh. Watch out for the bird. Sorry. Oh! oh. No, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> He's good. See, once our brain and our being has had that direct experience of extraordinary human potential it can't go back but it's forced back because most people aren't living in that extraordinary human potential so it's challenging for one brain to stay in that despite the gravity of the way the society is structured hence the recovery movement is impossible because we can't recover back into that which we were after we've touched that extraordinary realm that extraordinary potential that the brain has access to so it's not about going back and trying to recover into old systems but pushing the limits of our potential to flower in new systems not even systems I don't know if we can systematize this I don't think we can. I think the birds agree with me. And I was thinking, or something came to mind along the lines of one of the reasons why I seem to experience this eight and a half month rhythm of five or so months good, good in quotes, three or so months not so good in quotes and then it just dies it's sort of like a flower that takes eight and a half months to grow and then it flowers and then it just dies so it could be a cycle of flowering and when it dies it dies back into old systems of the brain and then it can again flower out of that and the only thing that will allow that flower to keep flowering and not die at eight and a half months is having other flowers to cross pollinate with because then it it propagates flowering it propagates that same flower that we have access to and then we're not detached to our supposed personal flowering because I don't think flowering is a personal process It's that it's making it about a person that partly is what makes it die. I was driving to the park and I was thinking that energy or consciousness is sort of like lower today. And I was realizing that there was some kind of judgment of that as bad. Subtle, it wasn't thinking about it being bad, but it's still there's a sense of this isn't as good as what it could be. And then releasing that. I'm starting to read a book by Dr. Joe Dispenza called Becoming Supernatural. And I'm just in the beginning and it's talking about a story of a yogi who was able to put a handprint in rock. And since he was able to do this apparently in front of students 800 years ago or something, that forces the students to challenge their beliefs about reality because they saw it with their own eyes. Yet yeah, they can't do it themselves, but they did see it. And for some reason it made something come to mind along the lines of, I feel like it's possible that sometimes when people experience weird stuff in altered states, 
and there's others there and it's it's supposedly something that nobody can see so it could be a supposed hallucination or delusion other people can see it sometimes so say I'm with a friend and something weird happens and they can see it and then two weeks later I end up in the psych ward and in the psych ward I'm telling the psychiatrist about that experience but I'm saying it like the other person didn't see it. I'm saying XYZ happened and it's just to the psychiatrist a symptom or a hallucination. But my friend saw it too. But this is the same thing if you relate it to the cave story here. The guy did the handprint in the rock, which is impossible. Other people saw it know that it's impossible but saw that it was possible but they can't do it if they change their limiting beliefs they would be able to do it too but they can't so I feel like some weird stuff that happens and other people are around and maybe see it too they they see it but they realize it's beyond their beliefs so in a way they can't see it because they can't believe it because they can't do it themselves too so so some of these weird things that happen that other people see too and are witness to could change their beliefs but they are still not able to change their beliefs like there are people that are able to do really crazy impossible stuff but that doesn't mean that other people are going to be able to change their beliefs but what I'm saying is People who have these extraordinary states sometimes, who are labor, label, labeled later, kind of experience like a mystical experience where other people might be able to see it too. But they don't want to see it. Now I have an example in my own experience that I've talked about before where I was, got, I went to the hospital they wouldn't take me in and I came back home and there was blood on a red pepper in my place. And the people with me saw it too. They were the ones that took it out of the place and like threw it in the compost and they didn't know what to make of it themselves. But we never talked about it again. But they saw it and I saw it and I have a picture of it and I know it was blood, I tasted it and the pepper was sitting on the counter by itself in isolation, how did that get there? So that could be seen as sort of like a religious type phenomena for blood to be coming out of something. And if they were to think about it, they would realize that that came from the energy of my being or all of us, I don't know. But they're still unable to admit that reality is weird. And uh, something can happen that defies all beliefs. So just because someone sees something that is beyond belief doesn't mean their beliefs will change. And the thing is, I feel that for the one, like the experience might be arising because of the combination of people, not the one person who that then later gets diagnosed. But the thing is that the one who later gets diagnosed is the one that has their beliefs shattered. So in the one that gets diagnosed experience, it's like, holy crap, what is going on? This is so weird. Why is there blood on the red pepper? Whoa, reality's mess. Like, I don't understand anything. And that just blows one's mind and concepts all apart. And one loses one's sense of ego self or is already losing it. But then the others in the situation use that experience and don't have the same internal experience. They're just denying what's happening and thinking, wow, this person's crazy because they're losing their linear concepts. And so the one that's still in denial gets the free pass and the one that sees that reality is really weird gets labeled. So it's kind of backwards. Maybe one day it'll be to a point where weird stuff's happening all the time and the few people who can't see it are the ones that are thrown in some kind of weird reality so they can eventually get it. So I'm not sure how this book's going to be because it talks about something, something, both 
possibilities are correct in terms of whether the cave is solid or there's exceptions to those laws. And then it says, the difference is in the way that we choose to think about ourselves at any given moment. And like that's just loaded with misperceptions. There is no we, there is no I, there is no I that chooses. The I is the arising of the illusion of choice between this or that. We don't choose between, anyway, I just, that is the fundamental fallacy, is this whole thinking that there's this I that chooses. Yeah, it says, it depends on the way we choose to think about ourselves in a given moment. The way that we choose, we choose, both wrong, to think as if we think and are not thunked, so that's wrong, about, there is no such thing as about, ourselves, our and selves. <laughs> There's two in there that are eh. And it says, how do we awaken the power to transcend our own limiting beliefs? Again, there's no such thing as our own limiting beliefs. There's a process of belief in the brain which creates the epiphenomenon of the believer, which is I, which is an illusion. So it's not a process of transcending limiting beliefs, but seeing the fallacy of the I which is part of the structure that creates belief and the believer that believes beliefs. But there are, is no such division. And seeing in terms of that division is the problem, not limiting beliefs. It's that the I, which wants to accumulate knowledge, which is part of the belief structure, is the limiter. And if we think there's something that we can do to transcend it, that creates the doer, which is again the I, which is motive, which then we project what we need to do in order to, to transcend, which is also a belief. I believe I need to do this in order to transcend. So it's still part of belief. So we'll see what the book has to say, but yeah. And it says something about consciousness itself and the way we think about ourselves. The thinking process creates the illusion of the thinker. But there is no thinker thinking thoughts. So to say that it's how we think about ourselves, thinking about something makes us think that there's a thinker thinking about something, but there isn't. So again, that's not quite accurate. I'm questioning the accuracy of the languaging. And it's partly that we're reading and speaking in terms of this languaging that we hypnotize ourselves into thinking that this is how it is when it's not. And then we think we need to do something, but it's mainly the way that we use language. We don't use language. It uses us. It uses the human body and creates this false I that is separate from everything else. When the body is, in fact, one with life and enveloped and part and integrated into life. There's nothing to think about that. Can you hear the birds? I got this little whistle, the spiritual bookstore. kind of cute. I go away in just over a week or so and I've never gone away feeling like there's a bit of conflict but I do feel that this time so 
I have a little bit of a fear that that conflict will somehow create a scenario to draw me back here like some kind of physical accident where I need to be transported back home at some point or something like that. I'm not really afraid of it though but I'm just wondering how that dynamic will play out or if this is a gesture of detaching oneself from conditioning. Not permanently, but just creating that space to have time to settle into a brain state that doesn't have that. It's quite complex, I really don't know. And my brain feels a little bit like, oh man, I don't have enough time. I have, I do have time, but my brain feels a little slower today. So then it feels like there's not enough time to do everything I need to do before I go. When I do have enough time at this point, but there's always the chance that my brain could shut down and then it makes it hard to do anything. So we'll see how it goes. Today I want to spend some time in the park and Yesterday I had a nice day hanging out with two friends, going for walks in the park, and the day before I met up with a new friend, and that was nice, and the day before that I went to a concert. So I am doing a lot, and usually at this point in my biorhythm of energy, I'm doing a lot of plans and schemes to try to create something to help the world. And I've talked about how, since I've already written that up a couple times, I am doing things that indicate that I do have energy like hang out with friends, but then I'm not doing the thing where I'm writing so much. I did that one day and it felt like it burnt me out and I wrote 7,000 words in one day. So, just getting outside and connecting to the earth is really important and hopefully getting myself to where I want to be and after that I'm pretty open I don't know what's gonna happen exactly but I'll have a lot of time to sit and reflect with myself and I can't forget that this is a really important time because it could be crisis and maybe it won't be crisis. Not that I'm hoping it won't be, but that crisis usually is when there's a, like a peak energy state. It's like when the flower opens for the very short period of time and releases its beauty right before it dies. And maybe it doesn't have to be a flower that dies right after it opens and releases its beauty. The thing is when it releases its beauty, Everyone within range seems to dance with that. They come to look at the flower and they maybe they can't see the flower. They can't see why they're dancing that way. And I think it's disturbing to the field, to the field of conditioning, especially when one is amongst conditioning. But perhaps if that flower opens in a beautiful field, literally, in a beautiful space, then perhaps it just opens anonymously and flowers and and maybe it doesn't die maybe it stays flowering anonymously because there's no one around to pick up on the fact that it's there because it's not safe to do that amongst the conditioning so that would be kind of like say there was an endangered species and it was like the last of its kind. You wouldn't just have it out in the middle of a public park. You would protect it. You would keep it safe. You would have it in a perfect environment to hope that it survives because if it doesn't, that's the end. So it's the same sort of thing. You wouldn't just have it in the same daily life circumstances. But that's what happens to people when they flower and then it's misunderstood and then 
the flowers are thrown in hospitals and things like that. And this book is talking a little bit about how if you see or experience something that's kind of impossible or you witness somebody experiencing that, then perhaps that makes it more possible for others or something. So I'm hoping I can get through this crisis and it not be a crisis but a transformation. Now since I've seen the danger of the conditioning, which is which manifests as security, a physical security, but then seeing how physical security amongst limitation is not security, it's insecurity because that would be like keeping a flower in a airtight container, thinking you're keeping it safe when it needs oxygen, it needs light. You can't put a flower in this dark, airtight container and then think that it's secure. It's not. It's a living thing. You can't contain it. So in the same way, this living thing needs different environment. And perhaps this will show the need for people to be in sanctuary when this happens. And perhaps if a few people can get themselves to a place where they can get to sanctuary and transform, and see that that energy undistorted is all that one really needs and it's not even that's even mislanguaging it's one it's what one is as oneness with life even that sounds wrong because it's as one is that it's beyond being that it's a fact so We'll see. I don't know what I'm talking about, but perhaps it's sort of talking myself into what I'm doing because it is a little bit risky. But I'm not really afraid of that. And the vitamin thing has been going smoothly, so I do have to re-study that. Because when it goes smoothly, then I can possibly forget about the variation that I might need to do. So, yeah, if I can do this and transform... The part I'm wondering about if, is if the transformation can settle in to the point where it doesn't matter where I am. Or does it matter? Does it matter? Does the environment matter? And it might. I might need to stay in beauty for quite a while and then be like in and out of the city, not living in the city. And that might not matter either. It might only matter that one is among people who see. I don't know. Not sure. This book is reminding me of something that already came to mind, which was that and I've talked about this before, that mental health labels, which isn't an accurate depiction of what's happening, really, but all of that is part of the human potential movement. And that has been the path of this entity here and we'll see what happens but hopefully others can see that as a possible human potential movement
And I'm starting to see what what homelessness could possibly mean. It's not participating in the conditioning. Our home isn't in this field of thought and conditioning. Like our whole world would change if we saw things differently. Our home planet Earth would be paradise. It would be something totally different. I am a homeless person. The conditioned world isn't my home, and it doesn't create a home. This world needs a lot more love. I was just reminded of something that's happening lately, within the last week. Forgetfulness. I don't remember putting this on. I put these on, for sure. I don't remember putting this on. And... That's happened a few times. Like last night, I usually use a water pick morning and night to clean out my teeth and then brush my teeth. I, When I did the water pick, I wasn't sure if I just did it. I might have. I kind of like felt like I did and I might have, but I just really didn't know. So that is a little hard because I put my evening supplements that I take before bed together in a little container. And last night, I was pretty sure I didn't have the quetiapine in there. And I had eaten all of them, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure there wasn't quetiapine in there. I'm pretty sure I forgot to put it in. So I took two more, but I don't think I took two, but I wasn't sure. That's a tough one. But just being a bit more forgetful. But the thing is, if I'm not doing stuff where I, I don't really need to remember, it's not a big deal. In the past, when I've had a crisis, I've been doing things where I have to have executive functioning and collate things, which takes some brain processing that was disappearing and then it gets frustrating. But if I'm not doing those things, then it doesn't really matter. So that's why I'm spending my time in the park when I can and then with friends and doing a little bit of work, but not really too much writing but talking to myself seems to be okay I've done that and at times that makes me breathe calm so I think there's something different about writing something down and talking about it or talking about something without writing it down it's more present if I write something down it indicates that I need to come back to it later whereas when I'm talking to myself that's the finished thing I'm not gonna watch this again and yeah, it's the finished thing. It's finished. And I don't have to remember anything. If it's something I wrote down, I put a little check mark beside it and it's done. So something about being done with something that negates the whole concept of forgetting. Which could be a concept based on having a motive to do certain things.